Thank you, and thank you, Arvin, for the introduction. And also, uh, I want to thank uh, all the audience, and my colleagues, and, and you guys get up so early to come to this meeting. Uh, I'm honored to give this talk here, and at the same time, I'm very nervous because I haven't seen many pioneers and leaders in the field of gene therapy get up so early to come to this talk. Unfortunately, what I'm going to talk is, is kind of uh, more basic uh, about, you know, if you just get into AAV field and gene therapy field and how our field uh, progress and how you are, you know, what's the best way to select new stereotypes for your applications. And also, uh, this meeting is just uh, incredible. I, last night at the board of director meeting, uh, <coughs> ASGCT office director David Barrett report to the board and the president, uh, Cindy Dunbar, that today and by last night, we have about 2,700 attendees. And this is really second to the best uh, attendance uh, of SGCT history. I think the previous one was uh, Boston. And so this, uh, this is uh, the best one. And compared to one of our lowest attended, attended meeting was like uh, 1,600. So you guys can see how fast the field is grow. And, and I think we, everybody as a gene therapy researcher, were very excited to see this train of the growth. So what I'm going to talk about today is some basics of, of uh, AAV. So first, this is my, uh, my uh, disclosure slides. And so first I'm, I'm going to tell you it's about how gene, what are the gene therapy strategies and what are the historic progress or events uh, in vector development. So in terms of gene therapy strategies, I mean we have many different ways to accomplish gene therapy, but I would like to summarize into two strategies. The first one it's one just you use AAV or any gene therapy drug just as a regular drug. You directly give it to human, and by doing so, you accomplish therapeutic uh, effect, such as um, Glybera. <clears throat> and second strategy, you basically have the vector, but you take out the human cells, you genetically engineering by viral vector ex vivo just like CAR T cell, and then you expand it somewhat and then give back to human. So all the gene therapy we're talking about today, I think are using those, one of those two strategies. So the key for this, as you can see, is a vector. So for in vivo use, we have used adeno, we have used herpes, and we have used AAV and non-viral, and today's topic is going to focus on AAV. And for uh, ex vivo, we have used uh, RNA virus, lenti, retro virus. So if you go think about human gene th uh, therapy history, and you can see all the, every step of development and progress made is driven by vector development. The first proof of concept by Dr. French Anderson in early 90s is use lentivirus, or use uh, retrovirus to treat this uh, girl, and this is a very important milestone of gene therapy, showing the potential success of the gene therapy. And gradually, retrovirus, you know, uh, out of fashion. Instead, we have our lentivirus uh, come up, and first use lentivirus for HIV, and then we have used for other applications such as a CAR T cell as well as some genetic diseases. And then in early 90s, uh, important virus come up, that is adenovirus. This is a, probably the best, most efficient gene transfer vector we have tested. Unfortunately, this virus have, comes with price. We have a gene therapy volunteer, Jason Gausinger, uh, passed away because of an innate immunity and a cytokine storm in 1999, September 17th. And after that, our field 
our field as well as adenovirus gradually go down. Importantly, another virus that is a herpes simplex virus and, and become a gene therapy delivery vehicles and has different applications, initially as an oncogenic virus for cancer and, and then for uh, kill the pain. And an important virus coming up in mid-90s, that is adeno-associated virus. And this virus, first proof of concept by cystic fibrosis research and by Terry Flaw, with the first human trial, 1995 November, for human application cystic fibrosis gene therapy. And afterwards, uh, we have uh, the uh, discovery of 2002 by Jim Watson and uh, luckily myself. And we discussed this virus, which is AV8, has a great liver tropism. And then another important milestone uh, that is uh, uh, really uh, the AV2 for eye uh, gene therapy. And that's critical milestone in AAV. And then AV8 as the most trop never tropic vector was used for homophenia. And in 2011, published the New England Journal of Medicine. And of course, a critical milestone symbolized commercialization of AAV is Galibera by Unicare in 2012 uh, in European <clears throat> Union. And then if you look at the gene therapy viral vector de development and uh, human gene therapy, I think our path has been curvy. However, I think we are in a good time, exciting time, gene therapy really going up. And, and uh, so I think our road beyond is bright, and, but of course, full of the challenges. So myself has been in gene therapy 20 some years. I think my dream vector is highly efficient and stable. That means one shot forever and also with little immunotoxicity, not like adenovirus. And also we want to low genotoxicity. Uh, we probably want to avoid non-specific random insertional mutagenesis. Sometimes it can be caused by RNA virus. But we believe that the associated virus has it all. It has all those advantages. So, now I'm going to give you an introduction of AAV biology and vector biology. So for those who are just entering this field, I want to let you know AAV genome is small, but not that simple. It's through alternative splicing, generate three different capsid protein, four different regulatory protein, and also there's a critical uh, viral assembly protein. We have some beautiful talk, yes, talks yesterday about this. And this is a member of uh, uh, paraviral, and this is a helper-dependent uh, virus. So this is a, a reason called adenosuchia virus because it was initially uh, discovered as a contaminant in adenovirus preps. This is a naturally defective virus. That's why some of my colleagues called almost a virus. And this is one of the smallest, the mammalian virus, and only 26 nanometer. One of the major limitations with AAV is a small size, only 4.7 kV. This is a blind residential virus in humans, and many of us carry this virus in one way or another. And AAV has been saved in more than 2,000 patients and 130 clinical trials. And importantly, in the past two decades or so, we developed second generation of adenovirus derived from primate. And this become a critical, uh, uh, very essential tools for current state of the gene therapy, in vivo gene therapy. And that was discovered in 1965. And by the time I was at uh, Jim Wilson's lab, um, we have up to about 100. But if you ask me how, much we how many viral natural virus we have now. I think in our laboratory at UMass, we probably have more than a thousand. Now it takes generations of graduate students and postdocs to characterize them. 
And so avian infection in primates, I can summarize in four words. One is a highly prevalence. More than 80% of human uh, has either seropositive or molecular positive. And it's persistence. Once you're infected by AAV, I mean animals at least, you have a lifetime there. And privileged, it has relatively low immunogenicity and it's a, it's a pathogen, uh, pathogen, uh, pathogenicness, so it does not cause any disease. So how do you convert the AAV, this is so good, how do you transform into amazing vector? So basically you take out white type genes, replace a expression cut set of your transgene of interest, and then you provide helper function, doesn't matter, backward virus, animal virus, herpes simplex virus, and then you provide RepCap sequence. And then you put it into a packaging cell, then you produce the virus of your interest. And then beauty of this is that you can do trans encapsidation, replace this original AV2 with different capsids such as AV9 or AV8 and you have different serotypes. So that's how you generate vector. But how vector behaves in transduction, and then there are several critical steps. First, you have this receptor binding, like any virus, this is a receptor media process. And then you have internalization through a complete process. And then you have endosome trafficking, and through uh, endosome acidification, eventually the virus will have a nuclear entry and once you enter there, a critical step called uncoding and the genome release. And in that process, you, you, because AV is a, is a single strand, uh, it's a cell, um, it's a, a positive strand, negative strand packaged equally. Uh, and then based on some discovery, by Jim Watson and Drew Samosky and some other lab, they believe A and Arunsh Ristava, and they believe AAV have the second strand synthesized, you host the mechanism. Or by Mark Hay, suggest you have a self and meaning um, form the double strand AAV, and then they further stabilized by circularization and they further stabilized by concatamerization, and then from all those molecules you have your transcripts of transgene, and then you generate your transgene expression. So that's a general process of AAV transduction biology. And now, nowadays, as I said, there are many different strategies to engineer a capsid, and there's a reason for that. If you look at AAV, it's really a teamwork from, outside, uh, uh, from the inside out the capital itself play multiple roles. The first role is a guide where to go. And that is through the uh, cellular interactions, immunological interactions, and receptor binding uptaking. And the second one is to direct uh, how to get there. That's usually through uh, intracellular trafficking. And third one is to drop your genome at the right zip code. And however, Capsid is important, but genome are also important. We have a talk today. One is a focus on immunogenicity. One is a focus on how to design the genome. And the genome play two roles. First of all, that's where your active drug is and provides the drug. And second is determining how AAV can stay permanently in a cell. So if you look at different serotypes, and here there's a nice review here, and tell you in a linear form, AAV either has a huge difference, such as AV5, AV4, about 40-some percent disseminarity. But if you look at AV1 and 6, only 1 percent amino acid difference, 6 amino acid difference. And if you look at capsule structure with uh, the Michael Chapman as well as uh, Davis uh, McKinnell, uh, uh, Mavis uh, McKinnell's work, they have now categorized many capsids there. They do have differences in structure. So the structure differences first make those different AAV that will bind into different receptors. As you can see, many different laboratories now have discovered different serotypes, start with a juice lab 
and then uh, Ron's lab and some other lab such as uh, Jay's uh, Creating's lab and, and as well as Jim Wilson as well as Auburn lab discovered different serotonin Marquez lab, a different receptor biology, which is critical. The most exciting one was recently AAVR by Michael Chapman's lab and those things are critical. And because of receptorology differences and some other differences, they have a different caps, they have different uh, tissue tropism as summarized by this review. And one thing I had to tell you is the capsid is so important. It not only determines the tropism, but also play a critical role on, on, on the uh, immune response. One of the interesting factor we isolated from a racist monkey uh, family, we call it uh, AAV4 family, race 32, 31, 33. Luke Vandenberg um, combined uh, race 32 and 33, create artificial vector called 32, 33. This vector is very interesting. Even though it's very, uh, can transduce quite efficiently, but has a very different immune uh, property as this work by Mavis lab characterized the structure it's very different at a uh, uh, threefold uh, axis. And then when you get into the muscle, you can see compare AV8 and 3233, the muscle tropism initially is okay, but if you look at later stage, you can see you have a quick loss of transient expression, strong CD8 and the CD4 uh, reactions infiltrates as compared to AV8. And however, you have to remember for those colleagues who would like to do genetic vaccine and other purposes, this is the best capsid for your application. If you want to do stable gene transfer, please don't consider this capsid. And capsid engineering, as we said, the topic here is ABC and the library of AAVs. In the past 20 years or so, uh, we have a different strategy and making AAVs. The first one, I have to say, is direct evolution. Uh, by our colleague David Schaefer, pioneered this area. Now, many labs have generated beautiful libraries uh, through direct evolution. And then we have regional design by many different groups. And the more recent one is Luke Vandenberg's lab, designed by uh, phylogenetics analysis and bioinformatics and generate some uh, uh, designer ancestry sequences. And another one is old time fashion, just myself. We have been trying to looking for natural uh, resources for natural diversity. And of course, a few other labs like Phil Johnson's lab, they have done tremendous work in this area. And so in terms of capsule engineering, I was first of all to introduce this natural diversity. And we started in uh, 1992, uh, 1980, uh, two, uh, 2002 uh, in Jim Wilson's lab. And, but now, at that time, we use regular sequencing as well as uh, uh, the uh, topo cloning. And, but now, what we have done is, uh, in our lab, uh, with the work by Guang Chao Xu, uh, Li Lo, as well as uh, Phil Tai, they have now developed a high throughput process and uh, uh, next generation sequencing and accompanied with a very sophisticated bioinformatics uh, pipeline. Now we are be able to generate thousands of AAV caps from human tissue or private tissue, whatever sources of interest. So the second is the caps engineering by direct evolution, as I said, and this field has been in many different ways has been driven or filled by this kind of strategy and many capsules generated in this way. And other one is regional design. And the, the slides I'm showing here, it's, it's an article that demonstrate how do you decorating or, or grafting AAV capsid with a receptor to direct a specific tumor tropism. And this is a definitely one of the directions to use AAV for cancer gene therapy and other applications. And as I just mentioned, Luke Vandenberg's lab and come out of original design by reconstruction of ancestral uh, sequences. And this is just published a couple of papers in Nature uh, uh, Biotechnology. So now we know how to make an AV library. 
I mean, exactly when you are facing hundreds, thousands of AV capsids, which cap serotype, uh, how are you going to choose for your applications? This become a common question. So if you ask me overview, how, do you, how are you going to do this? And actually, I would say three things. First, talk to experts. I believe my colleagues and myself were very happy to interact with all colleagues in the field and provide our experience in this area could save you a lot of time. I, in fact, I have been in very, uh, a lot of communication with the colleagues in the field. The second, you have to do a literature search. Look at this review paper uh, in Nature Method by Karen Kozowski and kind of very briefly, clearly describe some second generation primary AAV and its tropism in different tissues. Of course, more importantly, I had to say, you have to do some experiment yourself. To do so, first I'm going to address the question of a biodistribution, whether AAV can get to the right tissue you want. And the first thing you do is simple molecular biology. And this paper is by our colleague, Joe Rabinowitz, very early classic 2008 paper, examining nine different serotypes by extracted DNA, doing qPCR or digital PCR, look where AAV goes. And second thing is you want some reporter gene to assess tissue tropism. The first uh, uh, attractive uh, reporter gene is in vivo live imaging by Luciferase. Many different groups have used this. And the beauty of this is you can really look at in a live animal and by tissue, tissue distribution. And more interesting AAV is by uh, uh, Saswati uh, Chatterjee's lab and they discovered uh, CD34 cell tropic uh, AAV, like showing by this new surface beautifully, uh, go to a whole body. Yeah. So, and once you have this, you also can sack the animal do tissue specific analysis of the transduction. So, tropism analysis, another way, is use a cellular reporter genes. And basically, you isolate tissue characterized with a cellular marker define which cell types you transduced. And for example, this is a prostate transduction um, by EGP, receptor, uh, EGP reporter and a cellular marker defining cell type in prostate. And this is another showing that uh, transduction by IV deliberate and, and then you look at uh, the, uh, the ganglion cell transduction. And this is another paper summarized, use those kind of reporter gene, define different serotypes, transduce different cell types uh, in the eyes in sub-retina space. So, and there's another way to calculate or to characterize AAV transduction. That is efficiency. Exactly how much gene AAV can deliver. So in this case, you may need some quantitative assessment use secreting factors, such as use alpha-trypsin, which is a secretive factor, as use rhesus uh, CG, or use EPO. The beauty of EPO is it give you a physiological readout, hematocrats. So all those strategies can give you exactly side-by-side -side comparison of a different stereotype. If you combine these tissue-specific promoters, then you will know exactly in which tissue how much gene transfer you can accomplish. So then we are not only work on mouse. Mouse is good friends uh, for our gene therapy uh, research, but we need to do translation. So in translation process, uh, our colleague uh, Aron uh, Shrestova has published a nice review article, and, and this picture very nicely summarized how you translate from monkey to human. I have to say, from CNS, eye, heart, second muscle, even pancreas, and this translation has been most successful. However, liver seems to be an exception. I'm going to show you one exception in liver transduction of different AA serotypes. So in this case, that when we do a mouse injection with EGAP, AVA transduce both mouse and humanized liver uh, sections. But if we do the experiment with AV3B, we found only transduction in humanized liver, not in the mouse liver. And this is further uh, quantitatively uh, demonstrated by this double staining, showing that 
AV8 can transduce both mouse and human hepatocytes, and AV3 can only transduce human hepatocytes. So finally, I'm going to provide some other considerations when choosing among different AV serotypes. So of course, depends on your target. You have different road administration. I list a bunch of them. As you can see, the top ones are really, you want to do no co-gene transfer. It's more direct delivery. And the bottom one is systemic delivery. And that use different serotypes by either IV or IP injections. You can target uh, different tissues uh, in your target animals. And second thing I want to uh, describe here is when you treat an animal. So now in the field, people have tried as early as a prelatal in utero gene transfer, as well as neonatal gene transfer. It's become a very popular as particularly you have early intervention and you, ha you can have the target neurons uh, space very efficiently and you can need to uh, the, this, uh, um, of course, the one issue is you can have a lower dose. They finally, in adult animals, that you can do uh, different ways. Basically, what you can do is because now the cell division it basically stopped and then you have a more persistent transduction. But the problem you have here is the dose you require. And last issue I want to emphasize, when you do AV stereotypes, select your serotypes in non-human primates or primate animals, you really have to think about pre-existing immunity. As shown by this, these slides, when you have different titers of a pre-existing neutral as an antibody, you have a different level of transduction efficiency. So anything you want to start, even with cat and dogs, my advice to you is please do a pre-screening on neutralizing antibody. Otherwise, you will get a result that is not expected. And second thing is, of course, this is for everyone we're doing human gene therapy. Unfortunately, as I described earlier, human are pretty uh, prevalent for AAV. So when you do AAV serotypes, you better do a screening as well, as shown by Jim Watson's group, uh, Roberto Casido, and showing how prevalent some AAV is in human population. And so, of course, the strategy overcome, you can have, you know, pre-screening, you have uh, hemophoresis, you can have a different serotype, you can have empty capsid to capture those deuterides and antibody. You have a different ways to overcome this barrier. So that's the end of my talk. I want to have my special thanks to Dan Wang, a senior postdoc in my lab, helped me on, on the uh, slide preparation and another research associate helped me on the, uh, the making those uh, animation uh, slides. Thank you very much. A very nice, uh, Guang Peng. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. You. Um, I, I wonder if you could comment and give us some perspective on the recent work about development of hepatocellular carcinoma in mice after AAV treatment. Yes, uh, that's a critical question. If you guys pay attention to you, and Monica, uh, first, this was, again, uh, raised based on a Nature Genetics paper, and then we have a very hot debate on both uh, flat journal uh, uh, of gene therapy, molecular therapy, as well as another leading journal, human gene therapy. We have a series of special issues and talks on these uh, topics. I have to say, let's put it this way. So far, we, have not, we do not have a direct evidence from AAV gene transfer, and this causes uh, insertional mutagenesis and, uh, as well as HCC. But second thing we have to admit, in animal models, and particularly in mouse, that we do see this kind of phenomenon. And exactly the cause and possibility cause human HCC at this point remain to be safe, but we must take serious caution, do more research as work being done now um, by, uh, by Vendidi's lab and some other more labs uh, in this area, and, and also 
uh, these uh, 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 McCarty's lab and many labs that address this issue very seriously, I think that's we as a gene therapist we have to do responsibly for our patient. Hi, Guangping. Very nice talk. Um, Thank you. What I want to ask about the cis determinants for packaging. The way you drew it, it looks like the ITR sequences are required to get into the particle. Can you mix and match and have any pair work, any capsid, any ITR? Do they all package equally well, or do you have to design that bit too? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rick. I think uh, cross-packaging by different capsids, even partial of different capsids, has been done extensively in Juice Moskis lab uh, earlier. And in terms of ITR cross-packaging, particularly put hybrid ITRs, and this work has been done by Marquet and, and, and uh, Dirk uh, Green in um, early days. And the, the answer is they're all feasible, but in some cases, such as AV4, there's uh, REP2 recognition versus uh, REP4 requirements. But uh, overall, I said, yes, you can do that. But in terms of uh, genotoxicity, as well as some other persistence and biotribution, those things, I mean, we have less experience, but I think that's the area of research we should look into. All right. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank the, the educational committee and the organizer for inviting me today to to discuss uh, this topic. I also uh, would like to thank them for uh, giving this title, which is a little bit challenging because uh, I, I'm, I will be expected to give uh, solutions. I hope I will be satisfying in my job. Anyway, so, um, and this is this closure slide, and uh, this is a slide that you probably now know by heart because today we, we heard great talks about AAV. I think uh, I, I don't wanna uh, say much about uh, uh, AV, wild type AV and recombinant AV vectors, except that uh, from uh, an immunological point of view, it is uh, important to remember that humans are exposed to the wild type virus, and therefore they do have immunity uh, to what then we use as a gene therapy vehicle. So, in, okay, I need to coordinate, okay. Um, as you know, also, there is a lot of experience with the AAV vector platform in gene transfer in uh, uh, preclinical and clinical studies, and we know now that the uh, toolbox that is provided by AAV, different serotypes, different, different genome conformation, and so on, can be used to target a number of, uh, of tissues, as is shown here, and uh, uh, to, to, to basically treat several diseases, and in most of, in many of these cases, actually, in this list, uh, these are all uh, uh, indications that are now in the clinic for, uh, for gene therapy application. So uh, this is very, uh, a very important point about the AV vector, so their reliability in going all the way from the preclinical models all the way to the clinic. But also another important point about AV vectors is that, uh, yes, they're predominantly non in, non in, not integrating, but uh, uh, we know that they can drive long-term expression of a transgene uh, once they, we use them to target a, a post-mitotic tissue. And uh, uh, these are some examples. There will be more coming up uh, in the future, I'm sure. We know that we uh, can expect long-term expression multi-year in, in human muscle, in the liver, and uh, we have data also in, in the retina. But as I said, more data will, will come up as we follow up patients treated with AV vectors. So, uh, but this is not the topic. The topic of today is to discuss the immune responses to AAV and focus particularly on, uh, on T-cell immunity to the, to the vector. Uh, so, um, three main points. Humans are naturally exposed to wild type AAV, I already told you. Therefore, uh, uh, we have uh, pre-existing tuberal immunity to the virus, and uh, Dr. Gao touched on this point, so we need to prescreen subjects before inclusion in clinical trials to make sure that our vector is not neutralized but, uh, by uh, pre-existing antibodies. And finally, the, the last point is that uh, we observed in multiple trials that uh, uh, the activation of CTLs in the context of uh, AV gene transfer uh, so can lead to transgene expression and short-lived efficacy. And so I'm going to go first with the 
um, uh, immunity to AV in healthy donors. I think it's important to put uh, this into context when we consider the immunogenicity of our vectors. So the first point is that we learned through uh, many studies that human develop immunity to AV early in life. And this is the example of a study published in uh, 2012 by the group of Paul Monahan showing that if you follow antibody responses in humans uh, uh, based uh, we have in the uh, 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 y-axis the neutralizing activity of a serum and in the x-axis the age in years, you will see that there's a period after birth uh, about one year of age where the seroprevalence of AV is very, very low. But then after that you have an increase in seroprevalence that comes with the exposure uh, to, to the wild type virus and, and, and so that's when the development of antibodies, uh, so humoral immunity, occurs into humans. And along the same line, this is a study that was published uh, uh, a little while ago uh, by uh, Huey and colleagues showing that if you look at T-cell reactivity, so the other side of immunity, in, uh, 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 in this case where uh, splenocytes using an interferon gamma L spot, you can see that there's a very low frequency of uh, T-cell reactivity in younger uh, um, children, but then as you go up with age, you see the majority of subjects displaying this reactivity to the AV capsid. What is important is that if you uh, further look at the war artist T cells, in fact, they have the expected memory phenotype. In fact, uh, this is an experiment, again, from the paper of you and colleagues showing that, uh, uh, yes, you take splenocytes and you uh, re-stimulate them in vitro with the capsid uh, peptides, let's say, and you see a nice T-cell activity, and then further, if you uh, uh, look at which subset of T-cells are actually um, uh, responding to the AV capsid, you see that these are uh, memory uh, T-cells. And this work was also uh, uh, shown, by, it was I think yesterday, by Claudia Curanda from our lab, who showed using the, um, a little more sophisticated analysis, the site of in PBNCs stimulated with AV2 capsid that, uh, in fact, you can find uh, CD8 T cells, effector memory, responding to the capsid in, in human PBNCs. And so uh, this is uh, uh, very important. What is also very important is that uh, there's, a, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between the uh, prevalence of antibodies against AV and uh, T cell reactivity. And this uh, uh, is what happens. So if you look at antibodies in this panel, uh, antibodies to the capsid, so neutralizing antibodies and uh, binding antibodies, so uh, uh, functional assays versus, versus uh, just a binding assay, of course you see a nice correlation between the two. However, if you go and look at neutralizing antibodies in the uh, x-axis versus T-cell reactivity, you see that there's really no correlation. So uh, that means that, uh, that basically it doesn't mean that if you see a subject without antibodies, this subject will be naive uh, to the AV capsid. The other implication is that you cannot use this assay to prescreen subjects and say, okay, this person will not have a, a T-cell response to the AV capsid. Finally, one important point uh, uh, that has been uh, shown by, uh, um, in, in, in more than one publication is the fact that uh, T cells recognize uh, the, these uh, T cell epitopes coming from the AV capsid. And because AV are highly conserved across serotypes, you have uh, uh, cross reactivity. So, this experiment, uh, which was published again by Huey and colleagues, uh, shows that, for example, uh, peptide epitopes from uh, 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 AV1, AV2, and AV8 across different HLA type, they do cross-react when you test uh, uh, them against uh, for, for T-cell reactivity. And this is a system where the peptides were transfected into uh, human PBNCs. And this is important because, uh, uh, yes, we can try to engineer uh, AV serotypes, we can try to switch serotypes uh, to avoid uh, T-cell reactivity, but then we have to keep in mind that uh, epitope conservation and this cross-reactivity of epitope recognition by T-cells can actually, uh, anyway, uh, uh, it will make difficult, the, um, difficult for us to evade uh, T-cell responses uh, by sw simply switching serotype. Finally, the last point, and I promise I'm almost done with all the deep immunology slides, um, is, is, is about the innate immunity uh, to AV. This is a, a field uh, that I think was uh, uh, broadly disregarded in, in, in for, for a while, but then there's a growing interest 
into uh, the interaction with AV vectors with innate immune system. So um, this is, of course, too complicated for me to explain to you, but uh, as you may know, innate immunity is the first uh, uh, checkpoint of the human immune system for, for a pathogen, which then uh, really uh, generates the initial signal that then uh, leads to enhancement of the adaptive immunity, so T cells. And, um, and so the point here is that what do we know about AV and innate immunity? That we know, uh, today we know quite a bit, uh, and uh, this diagram here, which is from a review published in 2011, gives you an idea of the complexity of this uh, 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 interaction of the innate immune system with the adaptive immune system when it comes to AV vectors. And we're learning more and more, as I said, including the fact that, uh, uh, for example, at the level of the, of the antigen presenting cells, the cross presentation, cross priming of uh, uh, CD8 T cells uh, is mediated by uh, innate immunity. And this is a, a, a work that uh, is impressed now in blood uh, from Roland Herzog's lab. So we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, there's a lot of events that we don't necessarily see in our clinical trial, which are related to innate recognition of the AV capsid, which then lead to uh, activation adaptive immunity. Uh, again, this is work from uh, Claudia Curanda, which was presented yesterday as a poster, showing that, in fact, if you look at uh, uh, human uh, monocyte-related dendritic cells, there is a uh, when you expose them to the AV caps, AV2 capsid, there is activation of uh, the innate immune system with pro production of IL-2, uh, sorry, IL-6 and IL-1, uh, which you see for AV, but then in fact, uh, if you compare that with the same uh, experiment where you use another virus such as flu, you don't see the same extent of activation. So uh, um, I think this is a, a, an important aspect and it seems to be quite consistent from animal models to uh, human systems. So AV and the human immune system, uh, I think uh, uh, in the first couple of slides, these are the main points that I would like to, to bring home. The first, uh, the first point is that wild type AV naturally infects humans. So we know that humans have humoral and cell mediated immunity to the capsid. The exposure happens quite early in life uh, and then we have immunological memory. Um, antibody responses do not correlate with the T cell responses. The epitopes are quite conserved across serotypes, so they tend to recognize a broad range of serotypes. And finally, innate immunity uh, is uh, um, a factor to keep in consideration when we talk about AV vectors. So uh, this slide is only to say, well, is that really relevant? Uh, so uh, I think the main point here is to uh, look at the clinical experiment, uh, experience and see how that relates to what we know in the, of, about um, immunity to AV uh, in the context of a natural infection. I will press the wrong button. So to, um, today to uh, discuss this point, uh, uh, I will use uh, the, the, the long, rather long story of gene therapy for hemophilia just because today we have a very broad uh, data set about uh, uh, AV and, and uh, gene therapy in this context. This is just a slide. We will hear about hemophilia later during this meeting to tell you what is hemophilia. Uh, so it's an X-linked bleeding disorder. The genetic uh, causes are well defined, as well as the phenotype and what you need to achieve correction of the disease. And this was one of the points that really uh, uh, triggered the interest of gene therapies for hemophilia for now for uh, uh, quite a while. And uh, um, the early proof of concept uh, in the context of hemophilia, uh, in the context of liver gene transfer, really showed that you can use an AV vector uh, injected, in this case, via the portal vein of uh, uh, hemophilia B dog, so an AV vector expressing K9 factor 9, and you can nicely express your transgene for a long, long time. The follow-up of these dogs, I think, is over 10 years. And in fact, you can do the same uh, in mice, in rats, in dogs, in sheep, in animal primates, and they all express factor nine. And this is very important because uh, uh, it tells you that, uh, uh, yes, in, in animal models, we don't have any issues with the immune system, and uh, yes, we can actually achieve long-term expression uh, of a donated gene in the liver of uh, animal models. As you probably know, uh, this work, uh, at the time, this we are in the, uh, um, early 2000s led to the initiation of a clinical trial where an AV2 vector was uh, delivered to uh, the liver of hemophilia B subjects. And this was the uh, first gene therapy trial of, uh, of, uh, 
with this application. And uh, uh, here you see how, like in dogs, uh, after uh, uh, the infusion of the virus, there was expression of trans the transgene product, uh, factor 9, but then this expression was uh, short-lived, uh, and so definitely the result is different from what we observed in animal models. And also, in this case, this is a... Mm, I'm always pressing the wrong button, sorry. Um, uh, was, uh, in this case, also the loss of transgene expression was followed by an increase in liver enzymes. So there was hepatic damage and loss of transgene expression, and then uh, many studies really uh, uh, highlight the features of the phenomenon, which was asymptomatic, so there was nothing related to the transgene, so there was no transgene uh, uh, immune responses, there was no evidence of um, uh, co-infections that could have triggered this phenomenon, but then the main hypothesis that was formulated at the time was that the detection of a CD80 cell response against the AV capsid was responsible for the loss of transgene expression after uh, vector administration. And this is the model, basically, that shows that hepatocytes indeed can present the antigen in the context of class 1, and, uh, and so they would, now we, we've seen from the previous talk, the AV vectors enter the cell, and then when they're in, within the cell, they go processing um, via ubiquitination and processing via the protein for antigen presentation in the context of MHC class 1. And this is really the, uh, the trigger for recognition by the immune system and then clearance uh, with loss of transgene expression. And in fact, uh, John Finn, uh, at the time when I was at CHOP, showed very nicely that uh, if you take a cell line um, in a reporter system where you can actually measure luciferase, uh, in parallel to antigen presentation. So if you increase the multiplicity of infection of the cell line with AV, then you uh, increase the antigen presentation in a dose-dependent fashion. So yes, hepatocytes can present the antigen. Um, so the work that was performed uh, to understand the phenomenon really to led to the second generation AV uh, uh, liver gene transfer trials for hemophilia B, where, uh, as uh, actually I didn't coordinate with Dr. Gauba, in fact, uh, it was an AV8 vector that he called second generation, uh, was used to transduce the liver. The main advances of this trial was that the vector was in, infused via a peripheral vein, and uh, in case of need, uh, there was a provision of uh, uh, corticosteroids administration. And in fact, what happened was very similar to the previous trial, where there was expression of factor 9, and then at some point in time there was an increase in liver enzymes with loss of transgene expression, which was rescued by the administration of a short course of corticosteroids. At the same time, uh, like in the, in the AV2 trial, there was detection of uh, T-cell reactivity to the AV capsid measured by interferon gamma helispot in peripheral blood. So in this case, uh, everything was, went actually much better because the uh, intervention with immunosuppression really led to the rescue of transgene expression in, uh, in uh, uh, this subject. And uh, also we learn a lot from this trial. This is, uh, I, I will not go into the details because this is all published work. Um, what we learn about uh, uh, this response uh, observed in the Navy 8 trial is that the timing was very consistent across all subjects who had the response and was about uh, uh, six to nine weeks post vector administration. So this is nice, but this is also tell us that it, it goes a little bit against what I told you earlier, because if this is a memory recall response, so you would expect to have that a little earlier than six weeks after vector administration. In fact, if you get a flu, you don't wait six weeks to have a new response, otherwise you'd be dead, right? So. This is a little bit of an inconsistency in what we think uh, is the underlying cause of uh, uh, T-cell responses observed in, in, in AV gene transfer. The other point that is very important in this trial is that we learned that uh, the timing of intervention with immunosuppression is critical because if we wait too long, for example, if we wait seven days from uh, the, the first detection of increasing liver enzymes to the administration of uh, immunosuppression with prednisolone, then we lose almost all the transgene expression. So we need to really be ready to intervene with uh, uh, immunosuppression in case we observe uh, a T cell response uh, in, uh, or uh, any kind of liver inflammation in the, uh, the, in the context of uh, AV liver gene transfer. 
Now, this is a, a, an attempt to uh, gather data from multiple clinical trials. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of this uh, work is unpublished. They're all part of press release and commentaries. But uh, essentially, we've seen a little bit of everything going into the clinic uh, for uh, uh, the treatment of hemophilia B mostly, and also hemophilia A is now being conducted in a trial sponsored by Biomarine. And you, as you can see, you have a variety of serotypes. And more or less, we learned that uh, any, any serotype can trigger an immune response. That's something that we learned. And what we also seen in this trial is that, yes, most of the time we were able to modulate the immunogenicity of AV vectors with uh, administration of corticosteroids, but not all the time, because in some cases, in fact, the expression was lost despite the administration of uh, uh, corticosteroids. And so uh, I think we need to continue to look at the clinical data very carefully, and I will go back uh, and comment on it a little more in detail in the next couple of slides. So we need to keep looking at the clinical data and share them to try to understand better what's going on in, with, with AV and uh, T-cell responses. Now, um, this is just a table. It's almost, uh, I mean, I don't think it's terribly informative, but uh, uh, what, what I wanted to, I was trying when I was preparing the slides for this talk to, to summarize um, what we observed in the clinical trials. And basically, we've seen everything. For the most, we've seen liver enzyme elevation in the context of T-cell activity to the capsid and loss of transient expression. But it, this is for the most. And sometimes you observe no liver enzyme elevation, but T-cell activity to the capsid and no uh, loss of transient expression. And then we've seen more or less everything else. And this is very confusing. The only comforting point is that we've never seen a transgene immune response, and I think that's very important, especially in the context of uh, hemophilia. But I think uh, uh, basically now we're still uh, uh, dealing with low number of patients treated in fairly different trials, although we're always trying to treat hemophilia. And so um, the, the relative, uh, that's why I, I, I put down this comment that the relatively high variability of outcomes across trials reflects really the complexity of AV-based uh, uh, therapeutics, which I try to capture in this, uh, in this slide. So we have to uh, always take into account uh, the AV capsid, the AV genome, and the transgene product. These are three points very important because uh, we know we see a T cell activity to the capsid. We don't necessarily have a good way to monitor in humans uh, what happens with the AV and the genome, although we know innate immunity is a point. And the transgene product, yes, it doesn't seem to be a problem, but we never know. And also, there's a, really a notion of uh, additional point that we need to uh, take into consideration, the target tissue, the vector contaminants, the concurrent infections, which is an important point, the HLA type, and so on. So this together, of course, is not easy to understand. I think we, we are grasping a little bit what's going on, but we need to uh, continue to work on the immunogenicity of AV vectors to better understand that. So a nice list of outstanding issues and unanswered questions, but not to finish, I will have also the part of the solutions. The first point is that we still don't fully understand why animal models fail to re recapitulate the, uh, what we find in humans. I don't think we have, uh, we, we have some models which partially uh, recapitulate the, the findings in humans, but they're very, in a way, artificial. Uh, we don't know why all the trials don't, they don't behave the same, although, as I said, there's a lot of variables that go into a trial. Um, well, all the tissue, all the caps, definitely they're not the same. We learned that uh, from, the, from the previous talks. Uh, we cannot prescreen subject uh, uh, based on uh, pre-existing immunity. I don't think this is the approach to, to tackle the issue. And we're always looking in the wrong place because, of course, if we target the liver, we're looking at peripheral blood. Inevitably, we're always looking at peripheral blood, and then so probably we miss something. But anyway, as I promised from the title that I was assigned, I need to tell you what to do about it. And I try to do it in the best way I can. Um, possible solution number one would be to improve the, cap the vector design to reduce the therapeutic dose. I think there's a space to really put us in a less immunogenic context by improving 
the, the, the AV back torrent, I think I shouldn't say anything because uh, uh, my prior, uh, the, the prior presenters, they really went into the detail of this point. Uh, so of course, optimized transgene, hyperactive mutant protease and so on. I'll give you two examples. The first is the effect of the um, uh, engineered therapeutic protein. You all know about the or you may know about the factor 9 Padua, uh, there will be an abstract with the clinical data of an AV factor 9 Padua hyperactive uh, uh, protein uh, presented at the end of the meeting, I, th I think Saturday. So basically you have a protein that if your antigen is 1, your activity is 10, and so you definitely uh, can use that to decrease the therapeutic dose. Uh, we also try to do a similar thing with, in this case, uh, uh, of Pompe. We will, this will be presented, I think, tomorrow, uh, where we basically uh, engineer uh, acid, acid alpha glucosidase to get a dose advantage by having a secretable version of the transgene. And of course, there's all the uh, capsid engineering. But again, whatever I would say about that, it would be stupid. So I would say uh, this is some great work published by the K Lab and uh, uh, Nick. Nikki Polk will present an abstract about uh, humanized AV. Number two, make the vector less immunogenic, but I have to say, no matter what, AV will always remain a virus, so I think we need to think about that. So, of course, there's uh, a lot of discussion about immune escape variants, um, depleting the, the CPGs from the vector genome. This was uh, published in 2013 by Jim Wilson. Uh, eliminate alternate operating frames in the transgene to, to avoid any problem with that, uh, and uh, reduce capsid anti antigen presentation. John Finn showed that with uh, bortezomib, so a proteasome inhibitor, and uh, 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 Roland Herzog shows that, showed that using the um, arun Srivastava's mutant, uh, um, which basically prevent proteasomal uh, uh, degradation of the capsid. Of course, the, the point is that we don't have an animal model, so it would be very hard to uh, validate these strategies in a preclinical uh, setting before moving to the clinic. Nevertheless, we should keep this, this in mind. And, uh, and so uh, possible solutions, <coughs> sorry. Number three uh, is, of course, uh, uh, the good old uh, transient immunosuppression. And the, the, the first point, uh, I think, is very, very important, which is the timing of intervention. So, um, of course, uh, the, 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 I think in the, in the table I've shown uh, you earlier, there were, there were a number of, uh, of uh, use of immunosuppression, all with corticosteroids. And some people, uh, well, for the most, the use was therapeutic, meaning that uh, uh, what people have done was to monitor uh, liver enzymes, and whenever the, there was an increase in liver enzymes, that would, that would trigger uh, administration of corticosteroids. We know that this is uh, okay. However, this implies quite a bit of, uh, of work to uh, carefully monitoring uh, liver enzymes, and also, it's not always possible because you'll be uh, in the case of certain diseases uh, where uh, you cannot do that. One of them, for instance, could be, uh, is, sorry, also uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, the alternative is to go prophylactic, uh, and this is also a possibility, um, and it's being tested. And I'll come back to that in the next uh, couple of slides. Of course, uh, the, the point is you need to evaluate the risk-benefit ratio, so uh, you don't want to use uh, uh, enormously strong immunosuppression because that has some risk attached to it. There's interference with the, 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 of immunosuppression with the vector. I'll come back to the, that in a second. And perhaps uh, you can think about using um, novel approaches. Uh, for uh, some examples, okay, the last point, sorry about that, uh, is that we need to, the more we understand the immunogenicity of AV, probably the more we will be able to have more targeted immunosuppressive uh, approaches to the problem. Of course, uh, in, in our case, uh, this will be presented tomorrow, we tested different things. Uh, one is that, for example, Amin Meliani will present tomorrow the use of uh, rapamycin nanoparticles, which is a, a, a technology developed by Selecta. And if you do that in the context of aging transfer, you, you seem to actually control uh, T-cell reactivity to the AV capsid, uh, measured by interferon gamma helispot. But, Whenever we do immunosuppression, we need to be careful. 
And that's why, I'll, uh, I mean, this is probably vintage uh, gene therapy. It's very old data, but I think it's very, very important. Uh, the dark side of immunosuppression is the following. Whenever you do gene transfer, particularly you target the liver, you need to think that uh, your transgene may not be recognized as, a, as an immunogen, but it's because your body is developing uh, tolerance to the transgene. And this is really been very well characterized, particularly by the work of Roland Herzog, uh, also during my postdoc with him. Um, this is a phenomenon that in the case of the liver is mediated by the induction of regulatory T cells, which then really can powerfully modulate uh, uh, both uh, T and B cells directly against the transgene. But then the point is, the dark side of immunosuppression is the following. You want to check that because uh, if you apply an immunosuppression that for any reason interferes with the induction of regulatory T cells, then you may be out of luck. And in fact, you may, re yes, control the immunogenicity of the capsid, but you may actually trigger a, a, a powerful immune response against the transgene. So this is something that uh, um, we need to be careful, and, and I think we have the tools to test it in the preclinical arena before we apply new and exotic immunosuppressive regimens in the clinic. So I think I, I'm, at, I'm at the end of my uh, presentation uh, with a very uh, small short summary uh, about AV vector immunogenicity. The first point is that uh, liver toxicity um, observed in several trials is likely to be immune mediated. Um, the determinants are not in the completely defined, maybe uh, different across trials, because in fact the findings are different across trials. Um, of course, the best approach uh, to that, and this is probably my main message, is to uh, do everything you can to minimize the vector immunogenicity. And uh, finally, never stop looking at these responses, never stop uh, studying them, because this is what will help us to have a better grasp of, of what triggers immune response in the context of IV gene therapy. Uh, so I'll close by uh, thanking all the people. Okay, the list I would have had uh, like a, I needed uh, probably a, the, the, the equivalent to the white pages, but I will uh, simply uh, thank the people who worked hard uh, with me in France uh, and all the colleagues and also all the collaborators involved in this uh, work and of course the funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> in those clinical trials there's no um, immunity against a transgene can you comment like what do you think the reason is um, in the hemophilia uh, trial in particular the, the, there's two possible reasons one very important reason is that all the subjects selected were uh, already uh, extensively treated with recombinant proteins so very at very low risk of having a response to the transgene and the second, I would say, targeting the liver, you're more likely to induce tolerance to the transgene product. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Could you comment on uh, any possible differences between um, immune response of AAV and different animal models, if they exist? Uh, yes, in different animal models. Um, essentially, what you tend to observe is a, is a humoral immune response, so only development of antibodies. And we, we, at least uh, to my knowledge, unless you tweak the system a little bit, you don't see uh, a, an immune response, uh, a T cell response directed against the capsid, or you don't see that response rather to uh, really result in clearance of transduced cells, so loss of expression. This is, was never documented uh, in animal models, except when, again, uh, in particular models, like mouse models, where you do adoptive transfer and you do particular ways of immunizing the animal. Hi, uh, Federico, great talk. Uh, I wonder, uh, I, I believe you mentioned that there is correlation between binding antibodies and NABs. So would it be possible to use binding antibody to screen patients as opposed to NABs? It depends in which context. Highly depend. If you ask me, uh, I would say, if you're trying to do a, a target deliver where uh, your uh, 
Unfortunately, I didn't have time to go uh, through that in detail, but if you're targeting to, trying to target deliver your, develop, delivering your vector uh, systemically uh, at doses that are not enormous, then uh, you need to have the most sensitive assay you can, and that would be a neutralizing assay. If you um, are doing retinal gene transfer, I don't even know if you need the, the assay, but you know, in other contexts, perhaps you can uh, use a binding assay. Hi, Federico. What do you think, oh, sorry, of an adaptive, uh, as a model in mice, and a, an adaptive transfer uh, immune model? Do, do you think that would be a valid way to start to look at this? I think is, um, is, the, best, uh, is the best we have. Uh, so at the moment we do, I think uh, Roland Herzog was the, the person who really developed uh, uh, models where uh, um, you could immunize an, uh, a, a donor mouse and then transfer the cells to a recipient which was then uh, administered an AV vector. And he was able to tweak the system in a way that you would be uh, observing loss of transduction and loss of transgene expression, sorry, and, uh, and increase in different enzymes. So this is, a, of course, is not what happened in humans, but is the closest thing that we have which we could use to test uh, strategies to avoid these immune responses. I'd like to follow up on the comment you made around neutralizing versus binding antibodies. So there are several groups that are looking at both and have reported disconnects between patients that are positive for neutralizing and either negative or positive mm -hmm. for binding assays. Um, so I'm wondering in the instance where there's individuals that are negative for the neutralizing assay but positive for the binding assay, yeah. could that explain the, the patients that we see with a positive T cell response because the positive binding assay no, is saying that uh, they have in fact, previous exposure. Uh, yes. uh, I see. No, in fact, it goes along the way. Um, so certainly you have a, a number of subjects with, who are uh, negative for uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies and positive for binding antibodies. Um, however, um, again, neither of them correlate with the T cell reactivity. So that's, uh, you're still, yeah, we look into that and, and didn't correlate. Okay, thank you. That being said, let's wrap up this session.